to our community life. As always, there are many topics and issues to discuss, and we have another couple of great guests joining me this evening. First off, we're going to look at policing, how we want to be policed and what our police are doing to keep society safe. I'm delighted to welcome the Police and Crime Commissioner for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, Jason Abelwhite. On the telephone, are you there? I'm here, yes. Well, welcome to Salaam Radio. No, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. You're most welcome. Now, um, you've served in public life for many years in our region. You've been councillor in St Ives for 16 years, including a term as mayor, and then five years as leader of Huntingdonshire District Council. And uh, I gather you were elected our police and crime commissioner in May 2016. My goodness, you're making me feel really old now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I thought the other day, I mean, I know you're going to say I, I started off very young and I was in my 20s when I first got elected to my first council. Um, and this is my 20th year. It's like my big anniversary this year. My 20th year of public service uh, is this year. And I'm very, very proud of that time uh, that I've spent either at the very local level um, or at a district level or indeed a, a regional level where I was the uh, um, local government association chairman uh, for the east of England uh, as well. So I've, I've had an eclectic level of uh, different jobs uh, within the local uh, authorities and I was hugely uh, privileged and proud to be elected your police and crime commissioner back in 2016. Mm. Well, many congratulations on your first first 20 years in public service. <laughs> let's, hope, let's hope there's a few more yet. <laughs> Surely. Now, what, what made you want to take on this role? I think it, it, sort of, it's, it was a natural progression, I think, for me. Um, I was um, working a lot in community safety as uh, both a council leader, uh, and then um, uh, I, when the Police and Crime Commissioner role first came along um, uh, the first time, um, I was uh, one of the people that set up the Shadow Police and Crime um, Panel, uh, which is there to hold the, uh, the Police and Crime Commissioner to account. Um, and I ended up becoming the, the chair of that. Um, and uh, I stepped down as chair uh, of that in uh, 2016 and then stood for election uh, as the Police and Crime Commissioner. So it just felt to me that actually this is a role that I could really put my heart and soul into um, and I knew I was going to be working with some of the most professional uh, and, and fantastic people day in, day out. And I, I certainly um, haven't been disappointed in any way, shape or form. Well, um, given the role that you were in before you became elected, you must have known what you were letting yourself in for. <laughs> it's, it always feels a little bit like the gamekeeper turned poacher or the other way around. <laughs> yes. um, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's... Yeah, I absolutely knew what the role were, was going to entail. Um, and I, I'd like to think I've sort of made it my own as well um, with the sort of things that I do, the accessibility uh, of the way I operate and get out into the public. And notwithstanding the fact that, you you know, many people forget that, that Cambridgeshire and Peterborough as a, as a whole area uh, is 1,306 square miles with a population in excess of 845,000 people. So it's not only a big responsible job, but you represent an awfully big area and an awful lot of people. Mm. Um, I remember when police and crime commissioners were, were being introduced by the, the government at the time, mm -hmm. there, there yeah. were some question marks over whether this would add value or detract from the leadership of the police. But mm. So how does your work benefit the public? I think, well, first and foremost, um, people forget and they probably didn't realize that before um, police and crime commissioners there were still checks and balances mm. um, and holding to account that was done by the police authority uh, which actually was a council function uh, made up predominantly of councillors and a few independent um, people that sat on the on the panel um, who used to meet uh, once a quarter um, and uh, that's how they used to do the governance the budgeting and everything else that, that councils normally do I think the difference with a police and crime commissioner is, um, A, and first and foremost, by law, um, just to dispel any rumours, police and crime commissioners cannot interfere in the operational policing uh, of the chief constable. Um, so he is still, and rightfully so as the professional, um, 
responsible for day-to-day -day policing um, and all of the issues that surround policing um, day in, day out. So that is still firmly in, in his bailiwick. Where I add value is that I am doing the job all the time. I'm not meeting once a quarter. I'm mm. there every day. Um, I meet the public regularly. Um, I listen to their concerns. I develop a police and crime plan um, to which I then hold the Chief Constable to account to deliver that on behalf of the community. Um, and I also am able to work uh, much wider than the old police authority. So uh, we work very much more closely now with our community safety partners. And I, I'll give you an example. I chair the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Community Safety Partnership, uh, the Criminal Justice Board, which brings all of those uh, sort of um, partners together in the judicial system, uh, probation, prison service, uh, and rehabilitation. Um, so all of those partners, um, the police and crime commissioners, can bring together uh, and help to facilitate a better way of working um, and holding some of those other partners to account for what they are sometimes doing and sometimes what they're not as well. So, you know, I'm not just saying this, but, you know, the, the, there have been a review um, internally in government and there has been a real understanding now how police and crime commissioners, because they're in the heart of it and they're doing the job day in, day out, are adding a huge amount of value uh, than that was there before. Um, and, and how are the public able to influence your thinking and plans? Well, they get every opportunity to talk to me. Um, uh, it's a big county to get round, but my golly, do I. Um, I. I can't even think how many miles I'm doing a year these days. But... They get every opportunity, either in public surgeries. We quite often have uh, public meetings, especially if there are issues of specific concern. I get out and about with local councillors. We'll have walkabouts. Um, I had some of those in, in Peterborough. Uh, and that's not just party political. You know, that was with, you know, um, uh, members of the council from different political backgrounds. Um, and I get out there uh, with, with the public, and they have the accessibility of me as well. They can come and see me if they've got a specific issue. Mm. So we make ourselves accessible, and I make myself as accessible as I possibly can. And we also utilize things like social media, because there's more and more people uh, on that now. Um, and, I, and I use the example how powerful social media is now, mm. um, because uh, we had... Uh, some public meetings. We had six around the county because uh, one of my roles is to um, hire and fire the chief constable. Uh, I haven't had the uh, need to fire one, I'm absolutely pleased to say, um, but I've hired um, our chief constable who we've, we've got in now, Nick Dean, who's absolutely superb. Mm. And we, we decided very early on when he came in, we'd go out and we'd do some public um, um, consultation and meetings together. So we're right around the county and one of those was in Peterborough. And we probably had about 250 people in total that come to those meetings. But we live-streamed them. And as a consequence of that, we had 33,000 people watching. So it, it really does show that where we can not only get out and about, but where we utilize the technology, we can get out to more and more people. So I think it's, it's not just face-to-face -face these days, but it's actually acknowledging that we can uh, get to people in other means and other ways of media as well. Sure, and I think it's important that people have the right perception that you are there to listen to them and act on what you hear. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, Absolutely. we've actually had a text in from, a, from somebody listening in to our live show. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, they are listening with, and they haven't all turned off. Indeed. With, <laughs> with, here's a question for you. It says, sir, can yep. you tell me when we are likely to see an increased police <coughs> presence in the forgotten township of Breton? Okay. I think policing, I think first and foremost, you've got to understand that policing has fundamentally changed over the last 10 or even 15 years. And a lot of what the policing are now dealing with is behind closed doors. Mm. So it is domestic violence. It is, unfortunately, child abuse. Mm. Uh, child sex exploitation, uh, drug dealing, uh, which I hear a lot about um, in some of our bigger cities. Um, so the police are out there. They are in your communities. And I always say there are police as well. Uh, there's a big contingent of police that work in Cambridgeshire that are non-uniform. And they're mm. specifically non-uniform to, to obviously catch uh, the people that are, uh, that are um, facilitating crime uh, around our county. 
So it's not always the police that you don't see. Uh, it, and the police that you do see, obviously, because, you, you know, there are police out there, so please do look for them. What I have managed to achieve since being in office, however, um, is an uplift. And I thank you uh, and myself, because I'm a resident of Cambridgeshire, um, for the uh, small uplift in the council tax, which has meant that we've been able to take more officers on. And we've had record le levels of officers coming through. Um, last year, it was 160 that came through. Um, the system, um, and by the end of next year, we'll actually have record numbers of police officers, which is absolutely great. And I think there will be, uh, with those new officers now, a greater emphasis of getting back into those communities and becoming the traditional community-based policing that perhaps people are missing at the moment because of the complexity of crime and because of the seriousness of the vulnerability that police are dealing with day in, day out. Especially mental health, that's something that's absolutely huge now, um, and especially here in Cambridge here for some reason, the amount of mental health issues the police are dealing with day in, day out um, is enormous. And of course that does take them away um, from some of those more traditional community roles. Mm. But be assured, as police numbers increase, uh, I think you will see a really positive change in your communities. And be assured that Breton is not forgotten in any, any way, shape or form. Well, that, that's really good to know. I know where I live in, in the area where this studio is, in the Gladstone area. Um, yep. we, we used to have what, what felt like a local police team and a police sergeant yep. that we could build a relationship with. That We seem to have lost that for the moment, but hopefully that will come back. Yeah, yeah and, I th and I think that is important. It's really important that we have that local connection with, with policing because actually that's where a lot of the intelligence comes from mm. that helps the police do their job. You know, we quite often talk about, you know, the police cannot do their job without you, the public. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the intelligence about criminal activity comes from you. Um, so, you know, be assured that the police are there. They're dealing with a whole host of complexity and issues. Uh, and to put it into perspective, you know, um, over the course of a year, we get 350,000 calls through to our call centre um, and about 10,999 uh, calls to respond to every month. So the police are out there and they're working extremely hard on your behalf. Thank you. Um, I notice you have a campaign going on at the moment appealing to survivors of sexual violence to share yep. their views on support services. Uh, yep. I, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, certainly. Um, when, I, when I talked about vulnerability a little while ago, mm. um, one of my roles is to commission services for victims. Um, and, you know, it's, it's part of a much wider role that, that I do in terms of commissioning services. I suppose that's where the word commissioner comes from. Um, but um, we were successful um, two years ago in getting a, a substantial government grant um, for um, uh, victims uh, of sexual abuse and uh, domestic abuse. And that was £400,000, uh, which we're able to commission a service over three years. And in the first year, 400 very vulnerable children who had suffered some of the most horrendous and horrific crimes have been counselling, um, support, uh, and therapy um, by one of the most amazing charities that we work with who are commissioned to deliver this service, um, Embrace, uh, they're called. Um, and what we're looking at at the moment is obviously the continuation of that service. So what we want is people to come forward and actually give us some of their um, experiences of the service that they've had um, with a view that I think is a really important thing that we've done over the last two years and we want to definitely keep that going uh, going forwards. I think the importance of young people who've been, especially young children who've been victims of crime, is giving them every opportunity um, that they survive um, and that they rebuild their lives in the most positive way that they possibly can. Um, now, uh, people who've survived some form of abuse and particularly sexual violence um, are you put, are you asking them to get in touch in some way? Well, I think we've we've 
obviously we've got records of, of those sort of people, but a- actually um, anybody that's accessed that service mm. over the over the last year, that would be, um, over the last year, would be absolutely good um, if people could just give us a, a, a sort of feel of, of how they um, how they feel that service has gone. It's also, you know, we're we're you know abundantly you know living in in a world where you know there are a lot of historic cases of abuse that are coming forward as well mm. now. Um, you know, and it started with Jimmy Savile, and you know it's escalated year on year. And not every survivor and not every victim of, of such abuse will want to deal with that until they feel they're in a position that they can. And it's important that we we not only hear from those, but but actually make sure that those people um, who perpetrate these crimes are, are brought to justice as well. Thank you. Um, what other major plans do you have for our policing? Well, I think apart from growing numbers, which is which is really really good news, mm. um, I think in in terms of efficiency, uh, in terms of making sure that the police have got the right equipment, um, I've been leading on on some of the national programmes uh, over the last year, um, and also leading on a, a seven force procurement um, exercise where we've now got a procurement um, um, body uh, which uh, will deliver. Um, out of the £190 million worth of collective um, um, goods and services that Seven Forces um, has. We've got a Seven Force shared shared service programme, basically, mm-hmm. which is the whole of the East plus Kent. Okay. So Kent and Essex are together. So it, it's one of the biggest collaborations in policing in the UK. I'm really proud to say that I've led on this uh, specific programme. Um, and what that means is that with the savings that we'll make from procurement, basically buying the goods and services in across such a much bigger um, um, area, and obviously getting those economies of scale, uh, that will mean another two million pounds will be saved, uh, which will have no effect on policing at all, but putting more money on the front line uh, for our policing service. So, so it's things like that that we're driving at the moment which create the additional um, efficiency. Um, I'm also working at the moment um, on evidence base uh, to government about the underfunding for Cambridgeshire, which is historic. And that's not a political um, statement because every colour of every uh, political party that's been in either coalition or previously has not dealt with the fact that Cambridgeshire remains one of the highest growth areas. I mean, you look around Peterborough, you, every time I go there, there's another, another avenue being built, yes. let alone another, another, uh, another street. And, of course, all of that growth um, will put demands on our services, and it's incumbent that I think the government recognise that if we're going to take the growth, we've got to have the money that supports that growth as well and in supports our police service, especially uh, in ensuring that we can meet that demand Uh, which we are doing now, but making sure we do in the future. So producing the facts to uh, argue the case uh, politically with with whoever is in government is is an important role. It is, you know, and I I have direct access. I think that's one of the beauties of being an an individual, um, because there are only 43 uh, 43 police and crime commissioners or mayors with that responsibility um, across the whole of the country. Um, You do tend to have direct access to the Secretary of State and certainly the policing minister. Mm -hmm. Um, So it does give you that, that direct input. uh, Which I think otherwise you wouldn't have if you were just a member on an authority. Now, what about youth? Because youth is is underprovided for, um, Mm. and we can see some of the consequences of that, where people are being enticed into gangs, into pushing drugs, or into knife crime. There's, I think there's an eclectic problem, I think, in this country um, generally, and not, not just in some of the areas um, that are quite obvious across uh, Cambridgeshire where some of these issues are going to be. Um, and I think it, it, it is uh, an issue around education and schooling sometimes. Um, I think it's all too easy to exclude children these days. And there isn't a, um, there isn't another place that you can put them. So the, the, the only solution is if you exclude a child and then it's either another school that might not want them or they're going to be home educated, which I think is the worst thing that you can put um, somebody who's got uh, you know, behavioural issues uh, in. 
Um, and I think something needs to be done. There needs to be an extra layer, I think, um, that takes these, these people with the, with the additional problems and issues um, and actually helps to shape them in, into good citizens. Because these are the people, unfortunately, that do get coerced into the gang culture. These are the people that are more likely to be exploited, uh, and they don't realise they're being exploited um, until it's too late. Um, and they become the new drug dealers on behalf of, uh, you know, the, the people that obviously produce this stuff. Um, and they, they themselves, you know, I get I quite often here, you know, the young kid is dealing drugs down our rows without a, the people actually thinking that that person might be as much a victim um, as the, as, you know, the, uh, the people that are, that are obviously becoming addicted to the drug in the first place. So it is... I think it's incumbent of us all to work in partnerships or education. Um, it will be children's services as well and children's social care um, to make sure that we, we use the resource that we have in the most effective way. Um, I have uh, youth grants that I put out all the time um, and any youth um, organisation that is dealing with disruption. So it might just be somebody that's, that's picking up kids that are at risk uh, and they're putting them in a boxing glove and teaching them, you know, disciplines. Uh, you know, the, the Peterborough Boxing Club, the policing one, is an absolutely fantastic example mm -hmm. of that. You know, that, that in, um, you know, in terms of taking these children and, and, and giving them some hope um, and giving them that discipline and actually showing them how you get the aggression out in the right way. Mm. Um, and, and I think where there, there are lots of different groups and lots of different examples, but I think... I think there is a whole set, there's a much wider issue, I think, with, with younger people. Um, culturally, why some of them are carrying knives now is a real worry. Mm. Um, and I think it's incumbent of all of us, uh, and it starts with good parenting, it starts with good schooling, um, and it means that the whole community has their part to play uh, in shaping these young people as well. Yeah, and, and when you and I met, you came to visit us and Community First and Mohammed yep. Saeed, yep. and we wandered the streets around Lincoln Road. I was most we grateful did. for that time back in January. Um, and mm. you, you introduced me to a phrase, in fact, it was a philosophy about solving problems upstream. Yeah, that's right. We, we quite often talk about um, policing in a, in a reactive way. So police will quite often deal with the incident that's there in front of them. Um, and they'll, you know, and they're, they're very good at that. They're very good at problem solving. They're very good at reacting. So, you know, you have an emergency, the police react. I think where we've lost our way a little bit, and some of that will be down to the sort of financial constraints we've had over the, over the last years, um, is that it's the preventative work that actually has the best results in the long term. And that's where that, you know, that community team, that community policing, I think, does, does come into its own. Because it's, it, the upstream bit is, is getting upstream of the issue before it becomes an issue. Mm. Um, and, it is, and it is about um, not only stopping people falling in the stream, but a actually making sure that if they are in the stream, you have the mechanism which you, which, uh, in which you pull them out as well. Um, and that is very much um, getting into the heart and the root causes of, of some of the issues of why some youngsters get into criminality, why they get into gangs, uh, and why they are um, acting sometimes in the way, in a behavioural way in which they are. And sometimes a little bit of intervention upstream, um, early intervention in partnership with others, will actually have all of the positive effects you need, where, where actually further downstream you need less, you need less um, to deal with the issues, you then need less in terms of the, uh, the police responding to those sort of things. Uh, and, of course, even the criminal justice system you would need less of because you've got less, less people that then get into the criminal justice system and then go around this perpetual revolving door. And I think that's one of the biggest problems. Once people are in the justice system, they just keep going round and round it at the moment. And there's, there's no... I quite often talk about how I need to get my size nines firmly in this revolving door yes. uh, and try and get these offenders back on track um, and not creating harm in our community. So that's very much where the upstream work will come. And I think the uplift of officers is certainly going to help with that. 
Well, Jason, we've come to the end of our time. That's been absolutely fascinating. <laughs> um, no, really, we'd love to have you back on uh, as and when uh, issues and topics and opportunities come up, and particularly the preventive policing up front will get yeah. um, an opportunity to build that trust back and, mm. and build it even greater with, with our community. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's, it's been excellent. Thank you. OK. Well, now, do stay tuned to meet our next guest who has a mystery job in Peterborough that I will ask him to reveal once we have met him and heard about his earlier working life. Meanwhile, a big thank you to Police and Crime Commissioner Jason Abelwhite. Here come the ads. Stay tuned to Salam Radio after this short ad break. The Masjid is a centre of spirituality, education and a social hub for the community. In the times of the Blessed Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, the Masjid lay at the heart of society and was not just a place of sanctuary and prayer, but also a thriving educational institution. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is reported to have said, whoever builds a Masjid for Allah, be it large or small, Allah will build for him a house in paradise, Sunnah al-Tirmidhi. The role of the masjid that has always been instrumental in the educational, social and moral uplifting of the Muslim community. Please donate by visiting childrenofadam.net or call us on 0300 321 0032. Had a car accident or an accident at work? Accident specialists are experts in no-win, no-fee accident claims. Leave the hassle to us. Our multilingual settlement experts will manage the entire claims process on your behalf, with nothing to pay up front. We provide services such as credit hire, taxi vehicles, recovery, storage and much more. For full details on our range of services and a free consultation, call us on 01733 555 or visit our office at 249 Lincoln Road opposite the NatWest Bank. Accident specialists, start your successful claim today. If you're planning a boutique celebration, there's only one choice, Mumtaz Leeds. From boutique weddings to engagement parties, birthdays to work dues, with seating for up to 300 people, a perfect location and free car park. Plus, we have a private dining suite for 80 people with a beautiful waterfront view. Pre-wedding teas, parties and breakfasts also available. Mumtaz Leeds. Call 0113-242-4211. Salam Radio, in conjunction with the Council of British Hajis, presents a Hajj Seminar Sunday the 21st of July from 1pm at the Alama Iqbal Centre, 157 Cromwell Road, PE1 2EL. Multimedia guide presented in English by Sheikh Suleiman Ghani and Abdul Akbar. Learn how to perform Umrah and Hajj. Practical guide. Interactive Q&A, health and safety advice, Hajj Travel Shop. To book your tickets, visit cbhuk.org forward slash events or call 0845 833 4145. Hajj Seminar, Sunday the 21st of July from 1pm at the Alama Iqbal Centre, 157 Cromwell Road, PE1 2EL. Feel like some great tasting chicken tonight? Great meal deals, wraps, burgers, and sides. We've got it all at Chicken Palace. Call and collect at 302 Lincoln Road on 01733 702 447 or 8 Park Road on 01733 343750. Chicken Palace, open 11 a.m. till late. The Messenger of God, peace be upon him, said, Anyone who possesses three qualities finds thereby the sweetness of faith, that he loves God and his messenger, peace be upon him, more than anything else, that when he loves a human being, he loves him for God's sake alone, and that he abhors returning to unbelief from which God has rescued him, as he abhors being thrown into the fire. Narrated by Anas in the collections of Bukhari and Muslim. 
Welcome back to Salaam Radio on 106.2 FM and online at salaamradio.co.uk. This is Adrian Holdstock presenting Community Matters, the radio show for all communities across Peterborough and beyond. I have a brief news item before we come to our next guest. On Sunday the 14th of July, starting at 3pm, there will be a free film show at the John Clare Theatre above the library in Broadway, followed by a mixture of faith groups walking together to All Souls Church Garden and St Mark's Church Hall and Faison and Medina Mosque. Food will be served in the church hall and mosque. This is all in commemoration of something that happened 800 years ago between Christianity and Islam, when St Francis of Assisi crossed the battle lines of the Fourth Crusade to ask for an audience with the Sultan. Posters and social media will tell you how to get free tickets for this. Now let me welcome my second guest tonight. He's joined me in the studio. And his name is Dave Cramp. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Adrian. It's delighted uh, I am to be here. Now, I said before the break that you have a mystery job in Peterborough that (laughs) I will ask you to reveal once we've heard about your earlier working life. Okay. <laughs> so let me ask you first, what part of the world do you come from? Um, what, what did you want to do as you came to the end of school? Well, I'm a Yorkshireman, uh-huh. um, so I make no apologies. Hopefully you can all understand me. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I grew up in Doncaster in South Yorkshire. Um, and I, I, I left school really with a desire to do one thing pretty much, uh, which was to travel, mm. to, to travel the world. Um, I didn't get the opportunity to do that with my family as in growing up. We were, I think it, the, the term was we was poor. Um, so that's what I did. I, I, I got into, into that, uh, that sector. Hmm. Um, shall I go on? Do I tell you a bit more? Yes. Um, in the I reveal a bit more? So uh, you started work with which company? I went to work for the great and the good at Thomas Cook. Okay. In, yep. in 1982. Uh, I know heavens, uh, and I was only thinking the other day about the about the uniform that was required to be worn, and um, yes, the big collars and <laughs> and all of that um, in in what was yeah, coming out the eight, late seventies, early eighties. Um, yes, yeah, so I spent quite a lot of time working all over the UK mm-hmm. um, with Thomas Cook in a variety of roles, but most of them to do with retail, with mm-hmm. selling. Yep. Um, and as I'd started at a very junior position. Fully with the intention of going, as my father said, getting a proper job when I travelled a bit, um, I found myself staying with Thomas Cook for over 30 years. Oh, goodness. I know, yes. in a heartbeat, it, it disappears, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, and I was very fortunate. I met um, a tremendous amount of uh, very inspirational people. Mm-hmm. Um, I was fortunate to lead some fantastic teams mm-hmm. um, where I could learn very much from those in my charge. And I had a, a tremendous amount of satisfaction doing that through... All sorts of different roles, really. Mm. But that's really what brought me to Peterborough, ah. I suspect, um, uh, the Thomas Cook business. Ah, but then you had your, your initial ambition was to travel. Did you go around the world yeah, with very, Thomas Cook? Yes, very much so. Yes, I, I think it, I, I did gorge somewhat on uh, yeah. travelling. Um, <laughs> I spent a lot of time, money and, um, and, and effort in trying to see as much of the planet as I was mm. able to. And there's still many parts I've not been to, mm. um, but I, I managed to steer clear of lots of the concrete metropolis. I was probably unusual at 17 or 18 for not wanting to do that. Um, and I, I would consider myself now very fortunate to have experienced um, some, some most incredible sites uh, and, and met some fabulous people all over the world in, yeah. in, in many cultures. What, um, what, what's one of the more unusual experiences you've um, had? Well, I would have to talk about China, I, sus- okay. I suppose. I was mm. lucky enough to go to China not long after they were opening, they opened the Forbidden City for the first time uh-huh. to Westerners. Yes. Um, or, or, you know, Western devils, as we were referred to very much Gosh. so. It was really quite incredible. Um, and one evening we found ourselves um, in the Xi'an province, having been and visited the Terracotta Warriors, mm-hmm. which is a pretty remote location. Um, and a group of us were... Yeah, we'd finished our day. We were sitting in a very Western hotel. Mm. Didn't feel very Chinese, didn't feel very cultural. So we, we got a taxi and, and we said, well, just take us somewhere local, somewhere where uh. we would absolutely know where we were. Mm. In the taxi, 45 minutes, into darkness, we're in the mountains. Oh. I'm thinking, 
this might not have been such a good idea because <laughs> I don't speak any Chinese. Yeah. Um, and we, we were taken to a night market. And oh. it, it, you could see the light appear as, as, you, as we drove nearer. Mm. And it grew brighter. And it was clear it was a crossroads. And mm. this was where various villagers came together. They met. They traded. They exchanged stories. There were animals. There was bits of food. Mm. Um, and three Westerners turned up. Ah. Um, and it was the most fabulous evening because it was clear for some of those... Uh, people, they'd, they'd never seen anybody from the West. Um, and the taxi, dutifully, as if in minutes later, appeared to take us back. And we'd been there three or four hours. Mm. Um, and I don't think I'll ever forget that. Because mm. you couldn't have been anywhere else. Right. Uh, so, yeah, quite special. Uh, and then you see the sun come up over the Great Pyramid. Ah. Um, but those sort of experiences, that they stay with you. Mm. Um, so yes. Now I have have to delve in a little bit because although working for a travel company sounds fun, everyone wants a holiday bargain. Yes. <laughs> so so how were you involved in making ends meet and making the travel business a success? Well, that's really interesting because I think there's much written about Thomas Cook's uh, financial position. So if we steer mm. clear of that in the okay. short term, sure. um, certainly uh, my responsibilities were very much around balancing the books for the businesses that I led or managed. Hmm. Uh, and that was really always making certain that your income exceeded your costs because mm -hmm. um, the bit this left is very simple, old-fashioned profit. Yes. Uh, and we did make some money. Hmm. But I think people want uh, value for money. Hmm. Um, and somebody wanting a, a £20,000 cruise will still want value for money, even hmm. though they want to spend £20,000. Yeah. Somebody who wants a couple of nights in a caravan on the coast of Norfolk has a somewhat more modest budget, yes. but they still want to, to feel they had value for money. Sure. So for me, it was uh, about service, about giving the customer a service they're prepared to pay you a profit for. And I think those things um, hold, hold true in any retail, whether you're, whether you're selling oranges down on the road outside, mm. um, they need to look like nice oranges, mm. um, sold with a smile for value for money, or whether you're retailing property. I think the principles of good service are, are, are first and foremost. I'm itching to ask a final question about the travel industry um, because we're, st we're still in that uh, unknown world of prior to Brexit. Yes. <laughs> is that having a detrimental effect on the industry? Yeah, I think it is. Um, mm. I mean, many companies are posting um, results that are, are questioning mm. you know, what they're learning about their own business in terms of demand, cautiousness in the, in the market. Mm. Uh, a company I was working with quite recently in the UK tourist business were doing very nicely, thank you. Mm. And I think that was because of a, a generation who are probably still the bank of mum and dad, if mm. you like, um, being a little bit more cautious with their spend and probably wanting to avoid, well, what's going to happen when I'm there? Am I going to yeah. have a problem with my money? Am I going to have issues at the airport? Mm. Now, as it happens, no, in the short term. Mm. Um, but I think there's a bit of worry, um, more about well-being, industry generally, mm -hmm. um, and people's employment. And that's that British cautiousness, I think. Yes. Uh, and perhaps the holiday is something that, it, it, well, for some it's very important, but it might not be the most important thing if... Mm. You know, if you're helping your family to pay their mortgage or you're, you're helping young children to, you know, be, be shod, for right. want of a better word. Ah, but then, after 30 years, you decided on a lifestyle change. Yes. <laughs> um, and I thought for a moment when we had a chat about this yesterday, um, you were going to set off and improve your golf. Ah, yes. Oh, you've heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, to be fair, I think um, I, I done a bit, I've worked for Tom Scott for a long time. Then I did some work for myself, much in the same industry, trying to support uh, the travel, leisure, and tourism and hospitality industry. But I, I was working a lot of hours. Mm. Um, and I'm not 25 anymore, Adrian, mm. you know. Yeah. Uh, that was where you're supposed to say something like, <laughs> really, Dave? Uh, although I have given it away, I think. So, yes, it was very much, I, was, uh, I had a love affair with my car mm. and the M1. Oh. And, and whilst I liked the M1, spending yes. four hours a day on it mm. really wasn't the best for me yeah. and for my family. So, yep, took a, took a decision. Um, change my stars. Mm. Change my environment. Change what I did. Spend more time at home. I thought maybe get a few months off, play some golf. Ah. Um, and for anybody listening who's had the misfortune ever to play golf with me, I apologise. Um, I haven't got any better. Uh, but I'd like to do that. Mm. But that didn't really work out quite that way. So you started looking for a new career and interesting jobs that would attract you. Yes. What happened next? <laughs> um, I remember it vividly. I, I came home. Um, it was the middle of February. 
uh, it must have been you know middle of February, and I I sort of had been uh, suggesting to my lovely wife um, that I, I changed my job. She was delighted. Um, huh? I think secretly had been worrying about me for some time. Mm. Um, so I thought, right here, I'm going to strike while the iron's hot. So did a bit of engaging on social media. Uh, there are a couple of you know, those solutions that you go to to mm. to make your to be visible as seeking employment. I wasn't trying too hard, to be completely honest. Mm. Still thinking I might play a bit of golf. Um, and then I saw um, an advert, literally an advert, and mm. there it was. And and it appealed for curiosity, first of all, right. because I don't recall ever seeing um, jobs as such advertised for this particular place. Okay. So I read it in, in, in all detail. Um, and it was... It was really odd. Um, I, I found myself immediately sitting down with a pen thinking, I think I might want to do that. Mm. Um, thinking I really could help, mm. um, which, is, which is quite nice. Um, and I haven't really stopped to think about golf ever since, to be fair. Wow. Mm. So let's <laughs> let the cat out of the bag. What is your new job role? Well, Adrian, um, I, um, I feel blessed to be appointed as uh, commercial director for Peterborough Cathedral. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I look out of my window. I'm very, I'm very fortunate to have a, a little office on, in, in the precincts and I can see the, you know, the great west wall of, of, uh, of West Front of, 2030, of 1238 and I look at it and I still feel... I get the goosebumps Aye, that, yes. that, that uh, I'm part of something really special in Peterborough. Yeah, indeed. But it does sound a bit odd. A cathedral is for worship and teaching the Christian faith. Yes. So is, is this a city council post or maybe vivacity? Who's employing you? The, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and you're right, it is exactly that. Mm. It's, a, it's a house of God. But um, that's not my, um, my strength, if mm. I'm candid, you know, from what I've described. I... I I'm employed by the chapter um, that the Peterborough Cathedral. Um, okay. It's a direct post. So it sounds like a governing body. Yes, the chapter run the business. If you think of it as a board, mm -hmm. um, okay. essentially that, that's, that's what it does. Mm. It, it determines the plan mm. for the uh, business that is the, the cathedral. Mm -hmm. um, and then a number of uh, supporting executives and, and you know, execute that plan. Mm. So, yes, it's a, it's a Peterborough Cathedral post. Um, it's a two-year contract mm -hmm. um, because I have a very specific task that I'm, that I'm tasked with completing uh, or at least getting to grips with in that time. Mm. But it's not a job they've ever had before. Not in this format, no. I, I, I fundamentally, the, 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 the tasks that I'm executing with the team there um, have been in, in someone else's stewardship before. Mm. But this is a new role and, and funded very much um, to, to generate revenue. Mm. Um, to support the cathedral executing its plan and being yeah. able to conduct its mission in Peterborough. Yeah, which, which is back to its its primary function of, of leading worship and, and uh, enabling yeah. God's word to be spread yeah, and, and, as, and as so the, on. Yeah, and there's the mother yeah. church for the diocese. Yeah. Um, cathedrals is a really odd thing. I don't, I don't particularly mm. get into how they're structured, but if you were designing it as a business, it, it's a bit weird um, <laughs> because there's not really any income. Right. Um, yeah. and, and as commercial director, my job is to, is to create that, uh, okay. to sustain the income streams and grow them that, it, that we have mm. and to be creative and find some new ones. Do you know, I think about this funding, we need mm. to clear something up. Okay. Do cathedrals get subsidised by the government? Well, no. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's possibly one of the misconceptions. Because um, you would imagine, even if we just looked at the cathedral as an ancient monument, mm. and we said, here's a 900-year-old, if I'm honest, quite spectacular building, although mm. I probably would say that, wouldn't I? Um, you would think, yes, there, there would be some benefit that uh, the government would have in, in supporting the maintenance of that. Mm. Um, there is money to be had, but it's through heritage lottery funding, for example, which mm. requires a little blood, sweat and tears mm. to, uh, to procure. Um, so there's a small amount of funding from, from the church for our residential canons, mm. but we're, we're talking a, you know, a, a small sum. Mm. The 
but to, to, to run a cathedral costs hundreds a day even? Yes. Interestingly, um, the, a number that we've been looking at to get some clarity on this shows the operating costs or the, or, you know, over a year mm. would calculate to £4,120 a day to deliver yes. the work that the cathedral team do mm. and to provide safety in, in, in the fabric of the building mm. that we have the pleasure of looking after. Yeah. And pretty much all of that has to be made locally given yep absolutely grant funded. Um, yep uh, some grant funding mm. it's, a, it's a large chunk of our income um donations gifts mm. legacies um uh, there are some fabulously generous people in peterborough thank you uh, i'm sure there are more uh, don't be shy um <laughs> and then of course we 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 have events we have properties that the cathedral owns mm -hmm. so this is the thing um the cathedral does own some property mm. um it just doesn't have any cash. Right. Um, so that's the sort of primary challenge, really, is, is to get our assets to work for us mm. so that the money that is given and, and, and donated, we can directly do good with mm. rather than necessarily repairing the roof, etc. But some people would think that's a place of... It's the house of God. It's a place of worship. We don't want it to be sullied by tourist-type activities. Um, I think that's a good um, that's a good argument, and mm. interestingly enough, funnily enough, as you might imagine, mm. I've come across that mm -hmm. in my short tenure, and I have some a massive sympathy mm. um, because if we, let's just take one example. We we spend a considerable amount of time and effort um, trying to deliver excellence in music, particularly chorus choral music. Mm. Um, the choir is is outstanding, but it has to rehearse. Mm -hmm. And I was having a conversation um, with our organ scholar only the other day about how difficult it can be if you don't practice. Well, I mm. guess that's fairly obvious. I'm going to think about my putting um, is a really good example. <laughs> if I don't practice, then I'm going to know that. Mm. We have to be able to provide time in the building to do those sort of things. Mm. Well, actually, I'm sure I could sell tickets for organ practice, but I, I'm not sure that would be welcome. But I'd love to be able to find a way for things to happen that are adjacent to each other. And, and that's our mm. challenge. So we don't interrupt the services, but we have to find a way to monetize the space. Yes. I mean, I, I'm thinking of occasions when I've been on holiday and wandered into a church and discovered that they're practicing for a concert performance. Mm. So I get a free Lovely. presentation of a <laughs> choir and an orchestra, and it's, it's marvelous. Well, of course, you can do that if yes. you pop along to Evensong. Uh, in, you know, it's half past five in, I mean, during the week. Mm. You'll get to hear the choir. Um, in, in all its glory, and, yes. and, and that really is something to behold. Sure. Um, now, how does one train as a commercial director of a cathedral? <laughs> well, I'm doing it now, I think. Uh -huh. um, how do you train? I think you, you have to come with some experience. Mm. Um, I glean mine from confidence from what I've done in the past, yeah. and you, you can often bend the principles into your new environment. Mm. Um, and this is the other thing. Uh, I think this is really, really important. There are many people in the cathedral have real commercial talent mm. um, it's very hard to maintain that agenda all the time mm. there's conflict in in all of the mission with being able to pay for it sure you you you, you may have a pound uh, to give someone and there are three people begging it's you, somebody gets the pound and mm. you, they're the sort of decisions well my focus will be very very simple we have a task we need to make the cathedral pay for itself mm. we have to be sustainable mm. um, the spectre is is significant. If we mm. don't do that, then no business is sustained that makes a loss mm. and a considerable loss yeah. every year. So the the alternative is bleak. Unfortunately, um, whichever part of the business, the church uh, that I'm talking to, everybody gets that. Mm. But we're going to have to go on a journey yeah. together. Uh, just to, just just to tell you, I was at um, I the, the pleasure to be at Liverpool Cathedral. Ah a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I met some of the team there. And, and Liverpool's been on a similar journey mm -hmm. um, a number of years ago, struggling to make ends meet. And what inspired you when you saw them? Uh, two things. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, they don't have a 900-year-old cathedral, so uh. they have a, a modern cathedral finished mm -hmm. in the 70s, this in 1970s. Um, so there's no sort of, well, you must come and see the monument. You know, people are visiting the cathedral for the purpose that's in the building, so mm. to pray, to worship, for, mm. or for the attractions, mm -hmm. or their shop, or their many 
you know, there's two food and beverage outlets in there. So mm -hmm. they've um, adapted that space to cater for their community. Mm. And that's the start of the journey, I think, that we, uh, the cathedral, have got to take. We, we've got to bring people through the arch. I talk about this quite a bit. Mm. Through that Norman arch. Uh, take a moment to look at it because it's it was built in the 1170s. So <laughs> again, it's an incredible building. It, it's um, actually, isn't it, the west front? There are three fronts. Yes, yeah, very much so. Uh, well, I think it was extended twice. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, there was at the time of the, 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 the completion. There was a little bit of local snobbery about who had the biggest one. Uh. Uh, cathedral, yes. um, and if you, in fact, if you do come in and you look at the the um, the sequence of arches, you can actually tell very quickly that an extra bit was put on mm. just to make it a little bit longer than the cathedral just across the way. Mm. Uh, so yes, you're quite right. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, Twelve thirty-eight, of course, that was uh, completed. So it took now, a while to build. Yeah. Mm. Now coming in through that arch mm. reminds me that there are other cathedrals up and down the country I've been to visit. And I've been charged to go in. Yes. Is that part of your plan? Uh, not just to pray, no. Uh, in fact, uh, the bishop in, in his charge has said uh, he, he would like the cathedral to be free. Mm. You, you are welcome. And I think that's really important because mm. um, it is an ancient monument. It's quite special. Um, and you can come in and walk around and enjoy that for nothing. Mm. We will charge for certain things, Adrian. Mm. I, think, I think part of our journey is to try to showcase the space um, with, with events yeah. that, that we would like to charge for. And if we can have the patronage for those events, the profit from those will help us with our challenge of, of you know, fiscal maturity, really. And, and you've, you've had a corporate dinner recently where the, the tickets were something like £100. They were. They were, and, and it was quite humbling, really, that there are supporters of the trust, you know, mm. the Peterborough Trust that, that, that did that for us, who are prepared to take corporate you know, tables mm -hmm. um, and come and be very generous, not just in the ticket price, but mm. also in their charitable giving on the evening with the charity auction mm. and raffle. Um, and actually, that was, that was really quite a humbling experience. Of course, we had John McCarthy speak to us about his uh -huh. time of incarceration. Um, he was five years as a prisoner. He, he was. Um, what was really interesting, though, was him. Every now and again, you could see he'd stop and he, he would look up into the, into the, uh, the church and into the, into the ceiling. And, and, and he, would, he commented um, the, the environment was really getting to him, you know, right. this magnificent space. Yes. It was still quite a humbling thing. Wonderful. Uh, so yeah, those, those sort of things are okay. I'm, I'm, if I like, I'd like to do more stuff that brings the you're going to be more radical. For the first time. Oh, I'd love to. I be. mean, we, we've had BMW cars in there. Apparently, we've yes. had a gin festival in there. Yes, yes, coming back this year, but not in the cathedral this oh, year. Okay, right. Um, but there's still the gin. Yes. Um, I think we. It won't be that long before we do something that um, might make people think. We have um, an installation coming soon. The mm -hmm. the Earth or Gaia installation, the mm -hmm. artwork from Luke Jerram, mm. which is really topical because uh, this, this poses the question about how we, how we carry for our planet, which you, know, you can't pick up a newspaper without looking at that now. Mm. So we're, we're, look, you know, we're looking to, to have that uh, from the 19th oh, That's August. a lovely way to follow this year's uh, presentation of the moon. Of the moon. Well, yeah. it's the same artist, exactly. Yes. So okay. you must come along. Um, there's oh. a modest charge for that in yes. the evening of £2. Pounds. Oh. But, but it... it I can't believe, I, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but if you pop on our website, you'll, you'll mm. see that. Um, mm -hmm. And whatever your faith, you know, what you believe in, one thing for certain, we share this planet we're on. Mm -hmm. um, and it really will make you think. And if all it does, it may make you think a little bit about what we can each do yeah. uh, to safeguard this, this rock. Um, then it's a good thing, I think. Uh. Um, w what other specific events do you, have you got on the horizon? Ooh, um, I need to be careful. I don't share something on, on the radio that I'm not allowed to because okay. we've got some secrets. I oh. promise you Ooh, right. very soon a big reveal for next summer. Uh -huh. yes. um, and, and that will be a wow moment. Uh -huh. um, and just for the listeners now, uh, Adrian's got me in an arm lock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I can't reveal. Um, but certainly for this year, we, we've a number of things associated with whilst Gaia is in mm. residence. Uh, silent disco. We've, we've got some music. We've got a, um, an under-the-earth picnic 
Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to be running a competition. Um, well, I say we, um, BBC Radio Cambridgeshire are going to run it for us, which is to find somebody to turn on the earth. Uh, somebody who uh, wants to uh, switch it on at oh the beginning because it revolves you right. see so obviously i have an idea that will be some um that'll be some lovely photogenic uh, child that we you yes. know will come and, and be excited about that um and maybe a little bit more as we get in towards the end of the year before we find ourselves thinking towards christmas and christmas markets and carol services and, and all of that but um well we hope mm. uh, we, we we've come to the end of our time dave it's Heavens. flown by but we hope to have you back later in the year, if you would. Be more than, and, more than and happy. And tell us how the role's going and what else is coming up and how Gaia has, has been getting on. Brilliant. That's been wonderful. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. And come through the arch. Come and see us. <laughs> OK, we will. Well, that's all we have time for tonight on Community Matters. Uh, remember, you are the community that matters wherever you are. And we'd like everybody to be a community that lives in peace and harmony. Remember, on Sunday the afternoon, the 14th of July, it's free for the Francis and Sultan All Faiths Film, Food and Pilgrimage. And now from me, it's Salam, Shalom, Namaste and the peace of God to you all. Stay tuned to Salam Radio after this short ad break. Where can you get high quality and low...